friends. Oregon. Baylor in Oregon tomorrow night. Men's basketball tomorrow in Eugene, but also Dan Lanning, the new head coach, replacing Cristobal, who's at Miami. And they've hired one of Baylor's coaches, Matthew Powlitz, the safeties and special teams coach, will join uh, also Oregon staff. He'll coach Baylor in the bowl game, in the Sugar Bowl, from what we have been told. James Crepia joins us, the Oregonian. He's been with us before. Great stuff from him always. And, and James, a late start recruiting class that was so highly ranked and it kind of blows up because of the late change. How disappointed is that? And, and do they have time to recover with what's still out there? Well, certainly a degree of disappointment for a fan base when you know, Oregon had a top 10 class lined up. And frankly, I think they probably would have improved uh, relative to where they were. They were number nine. And I think that had the ch- various changes that occurred, which I, you know, there's reason to certainly be positive and optimistic about the new staff uh, as it comes together. But you know, ultimately, when you have a transition and the timeliness that it occurred, yeah, it really you know put a big dent in this recruiting class. Understandably, you know, young men are making the best decisions for them, and there's uncertainty, and uncertainty means you know it's hard to make a commitment to a situation when you're uncertain about who the coach is going to be, who the coordinator is going to be, who your position coach is going to be. So certainly some disappointment there in that they had a top 10 class lined up and probably would have even made incremental uh, gains on signing day had Mario Cristobal not left for Miami uh, and and set the dominoes in motion. Having said that, do they have time to improve in a big way? Absolutely. I mean, they've got seven players signed and they could potentially add uh, at least one more today even. Uh, so there's the opportunity for additions and improvement, like I say, still here in the early signing period as of now, and certainly between now and February. And that's that's ultimately going to be when this class is assessed from a recruiting perspective um, as an as an entire picture once we get to February. You know, there are plenty of schools out there who signed tremendous classes already, but they're locked in. I mean, they're, they're, there's not going to be much by way of additions between now and, between now and February. Uh, if it is, it'll be because they had some players, uh, you know, churn out and, and there'll be some attrition and they can sign up to 32 this year, everybody, if you have that kind of attrition. But otherwise, you know, the, the people have locked in some great classes and more power to them. Uh, congrats to them. They're basically locked in where they're at. Oregon's got a lot of flexibility. Having said that, you know, it's a finite talent pool because of the numbers of uh, players who signed, obviously, on Wednesday predominantly and yesterday and today. So we, we haven't talked to you since the whole Mario Cristobal, Dan Lanning, everything that went down. Uh, was Oregon uh, caught at all flat-footed by this, or were they ready to go knowing that Miami was was in the water uh, with Mario Cristobal and, and, and Dan Lanning, uh, you know, obviously was the guy they, they picked to replace him? No, they weren't caught flat-footed uh, by any stretch. It, was, it became clear, uh, obviously, over the course of, uh, well, for one, Oregon had been negotiating a deal with, with Mario in the first place. So let's, let's start there. Uh, they had, they were amidst their own negotiations. That's first. Uh, that was going on as things got closer to the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, and Miami's uh, efforts were certainly starting to get out there more and more places. Uh, fair to say that it, it became clearer and clearer to everyone involved that Miami was obviously very serious about uh, pursuing Mario. And, you know, you can't in any way really critique them or criticize them for that, you know, possibility. So, okay, they did. Uh, and then when push came to shove, there was going to be a real decision for Mario to make there. And there was. You know, yes, obviously, it's, he goes back to Miami, and that's where he's off to. But there was a real decision here, you know, because dollars and cents were, for all intents and purposes, basically the same, uh, with negligible, if any, different. And especially given the time, uh, an investment that he had made, you know, just in, in manpower and hours uh, and effort to build Oregon back up to a national powerhouse again uh, and to be really in a roster position where they were in outstanding position, were and are in outstanding position to compete on a higher level here for the next couple of years. You know, leaving that, whether it's for home or for money or for both, not as easy as it sounds. Um, and it really was a tough decision for him. Uh, but ultimately, again, he, he goes that way. So Oregon was not caught off guard, though. They weren't caught flat-footed. Uh, and ultimately, they went through a search process that start to finish. You know, took just about five days 
uh, you know, at a really not optimal time of year to be going through a search process, a major power conference, you know, head coaching job at a place with success and resources managed to land, uh, not just a coach, but by most people's measure, one of the top young defensive coaches in the country and did so in five days. I know there was some slight grumbling, I guess, at least uh, initially, you know, he's, he doesn't have connections to the Oregon program. There were some of the former players that were, I guess, concerned about, you know, be, not being an Oregon guy or whatever. Has all that kind of calmed down? Have the water settled in that regard? Well, for a good amount of them, I certainly don't want to speak for former players by any stretch, but based on those who put out the, uh, the now infamous letter and sent that to Rob Mullins, the athletic director, expressing some of those concerns as you've raised there and point out there. Um, yeah. Uh, many of them have, had, you know, since the hire came out uh, and said, hey, you know, the, the, the letter was sent at the beginning of the surge, not now, it had nothing to do with Dan uh, specifically, and that they really support him. And, you know, for, for, for others um, who were part of that also, who point out that, you know, they're still going to have concerns, not about Dan Lanning or his football acumen, but because, you know, he's somebody who did come out of the SEC. Uh, and now having said that, Dan Lanning is not a SEC lifer. You know, it's not like he's a country bumpkin from the backwoods of <laughs> Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi who, you know, went to uh, an SEC West school and his, you know, lifelong dream has been to coach at one of those places. Um, this guy out of Kansas City, Missouri, went to an NAI school outside Kansas City and happened to be working at Georgia, yes, and doing tremendous things there the last several years. But he brought somebody <laughs> from Atlanta. You know, he didn't put in his whole time there. Um, you know, again, he's from the heartland. Uh, so I, I get why players – look, Everybody wants their guy, whoever their guy is. Uh, and everybody wants to have the same thing that Miami got basically with Chris Ball. Or previously, uh, this fan base had to endure the one-year tenure of Willie Taggart where he left Florida State and he considered that a dream job. Everybody wants to feel like their co head coach believes that they're at their dream job. Yeah. And it's not just something that's said at a press conference. I get it. I understand it. I appreciate it. Having said that, as Rob Mullins has said, and as plenty of other people in the industry have said, it's a good thing when the people you, you have working for you are being coveted by other people. So it goes both ways. James, uh, Matt Pallage uh, headed uh, to Dan Lanning's staff from from here in Waco uh, on the Dave Aranda staff. They, they crossed paths briefly at Sam Houston State. Uh, what have you known about their, their connection and what Pallage's responsibilities will be there as co-DC? Will the DC call the defensive plays or will Dan Lanning because he's a defensive guy? Well, we're, we're going to probably get a little bit more clarity uh, on all that from Dan Lanning here in the days and weeks ahead. Um, I asked him last night if he could confirm Pallage specifically. Uh, and unfortunately, at that point, he could not, uh, alas, because, and this is, this is just a back, um, back room, uh, uh, paperwork, HR thing. This is not, you know, yes, he, Pallage is literally at practice today. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, this is not, now that Dan is working with Georgia, but, you know, Kenny Dillingham was at practice yesterday. He was in the building yesterday. Uh, he was officially announced today. Uh, obviously myself and others have reported that he was going to be the offensive coordinator a couple days ago. So this is more just a back end at the university HR process thing. So yes, it'll be obviously the coordinator, but, uh, because Lanning, uh, who spoke with us last night about the signing class and other things, unfortunately at that point, just didn't have, um, the, the go ahead from, you know, legal and HR and all those things to speak to some of this stuff. So we have to fill in a little, we have to color between the lines between now and, uh, obviously really like spring practice, I guess, <laughs> when it really kind of kicks in. Because ultimately, yeah, I know, you know it's a bowl game, and it's not necessarily a bowl game that everybody's uh, attuned to because there's coaching change and there's all these things to talk about. But they do play a bowl game, uh, and they do play a bowl game against Oklahoma, and it's a couple of 10-win teams, both teams in transition uh, with coaching staffs and players opting out and transferring and every which other thing going on. But that's kind of the task at hand, and the outgoing staff and the players who are still here are, focus on that uh and then in terms of what landing does with his staff and the rest that comes after uh and yes college obviously crossed paths with them at sam houston state uh i know about as much as you guys do by way of uh reading the bios and understanding the timeline uh but obviously uh, a coach in that college who from, from what i've you know heard seen and read um obviously uh, a young coach who has done some just tremendous things particularly not just on defense, but on special teams. It seems like everywhere he's been, uh, the special teams units have been just excellent. And that's 
music to the ears of Oregon fans who have uh, endured some rather rough special teams play the last couple of seasons in particular. Uh, and it's, it's not clear if, if Fowler should be involved in that. I can't imagine that Lanning's going to let his skills go to waste there um, because this, this is a team who needs a flat-out overhaul uh, on special teams. That, that, that doesn't have to do necessarily with the kicker or the punter. Uh, they're actually pretty good. It's uh, it's their coverage units in particular have just been downright miserable the past, not just this season, really going on like two-plus seasons. I think that Baylor's special teams, I'm not saying they were the best in the country, but with the punter, and you mentioned punter kicking game, got a little bit wobbly at the end, uh, but their coverage teams were fantastic, and they also had Ebner, of course, as a return guy. That didn't hurt. Uh, he was an All-American last year and up for that this year. All right, basketball. Tomorrow, Oregon will host Baylor. Uh, I'm not sure about what the crowd will be like because it's the holiday season or what's the, the actual schedule on campus as far as students. But Baylor, number one, coming in after the huge win against Villanova, defending national champion. What's, I know Oregon struggled, and they've lost a couple of heartbreakers recently in the Pac-12, but your thoughts about Oregon basketball right now? So they're coming off a performance that I mean, you don't want to put too much stock into because ultimately it is the opponent that it was in Portland. Um, but you know, better to look good in a situation like that than to, you know, have any kind of issue. So don't put stock necessarily into individual results or um, stat lines or things like that necessarily. But this is a team that started off the year in the first two games where they looked like a team that was in January form. It was it was really quite amazing. You're going, wow, like right out of the box, these guys are playing like this. My goodness, this is a serious, you know, <laughs> they're going to seriously be in the top 15, top 10. If they're playing like this all season, my goodness. And then the just wheels fell off. And it was just the total 180 degree opposite for several weeks where it looked like they went, they went from January form to like, do these guys even know each other's names? Uh, like they, they, the lack of uh, consistency, communication, coordination on both ends of the floor, offensive turnovers, uh, poor execution, uh, lack of defense communication or rotations. Everything is just a mess. Now, they've kind of righted the ship to a degree. You point out, yeah, they had a couple of real just brutal losses and, and to open up Pac-12 play uh, with the early games against uh, Arizona State and Stanford. Having said that, um, is that in and of itself going to be what decides you know what happens to them in the long run of the season? No. Uh, is Saturday going to decide it? Well, I mean, if they get a win, it would really be a monumental jolt when they need it. They've gotten off to a rocky start. They have. Having said that, there are some guys who, because they brought in a bunch of transfers, as they usually do, um, some of these guys are finding their roles a bit. And it's not as simple as, you know, fans necessarily believe. Um, and one of them in particular, Quincy Garrier, out of Syracuse, has really turned on here this past week and has had back-to-back -back games now where he's finding a role. Uh, and he's playing far and away the best basketball he's played first nine games of the season this is a guy who's averaging like somewhere around i think like 13 some odd points and like seven and a half eight rebounds in syracuse i mean he was miserable that year in the first nine games he was terrible uh there's no other way of putting it his stat lines were, were pales in comparison they, they were way 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 down and he just didn't didn't really fit uh you know they play a lot of man defense and a lot of you know full court press kind of pressure at times and Syracuse very much does not do that we know it's a 2-3 zone it has been since you know 40 years so he was really finding himself on both ends of the court he's playing better they still have some terrific talent on this team I'm not telling you that they're going to challenge Baylor tomorrow. <laughs> don't get me wrong right um, they've, they've got a lot to learn and, and they've got a really incredible opponent who plays a physical brand of basketball it's a great team they've obviously had some good games in years past uh, I think obviously this will be the biggest challenge that Oregon faces, not just this season, but probably in the last several seasons. But, you know, they've begun to play together better over the last week plus than they were. If Baylor, if this game was happening two, three weeks ago, guys, I said Baylor's going to run them out of the gym. Huh. I, it, it was that bad. It was, it was horrific. Now, I'm not telling you that they're back to form by any stretch of the imagination, but they're a lot better than they were two weeks ago, three weeks ago even close to four weeks ago, because after those first two games, I mean, they just got decimated by BYU, by uh, you know teams at the, the tournament they're at in Vegas with the Maui, Houston, Houston, yeah. crushed them, absolutely crushed them. So they're not as bad as what they look like in those games, but they're not as good as 
miraculously, I still defies logic how they looked so good in the first two games uh, and then had the drop off that they've had. So, again, they have the talent um, if they can ever get it to come together. And Dana Altman is, uh, you know, he's, that's kind of his magic that he pulls off every year. But even he's acknowledged they have so far to go and they have put themselves behind an eight ball in a bad way. But tomorrow's a monumental opportunity to at least get out a little bit from behind. Even in a loss, frankly, they could look they could look good enough to, in a way where you, you start to feel significantly better about things. You mentioned about what the situation on campus. They're a quarter school, so they wrapped up academics. Uh, a lot of the students have already gone home uh, for winter break because then they start up the winter quarter right after New Year's on January 3rd. So um, it won't necessarily be as packed from a student uh, standpoint, but I imagine that ticket sales that, that go to replace, you know, where they're at lower down and uh, other parts of the arena will be uh, pretty good because not first time ever at, at Matthew Knight Arena, which has been around for, I think it's 10 or 11 seasons now, first time that they've hosted a, a number one. Uh, they've hosted number two, you know, Arizona, UCLA has been in that kind of ilk and Oregon's obviously been a pretty good team too with the last decade, but never hasn't hosted a number one uh, in a while. So should be a should be a fun environment. Hey, James, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, a lot going on with the coaching change. Dan Lanning, tell Matthew Pollage. By the way, he gets married, I think, sometime here after the holidays. I believe that's right. So that's a little nugget for you to, to bring up if you get a chance to visit with him as well. Matthew Pollage, you're going to be leaving and is leaving. Baylor is still told he will coach uh, for Baylor. At least that's what I was told in the Sugar Bowl against uh, Ole Miss on January 1st. 